I will get us started. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Sandra Galea, and I have the privilege of serving as Dean of the Boston University School of Public Health. On behalf of our school, welcome. Before we begin, a word of thanks to everybody who helped make today happen, to the Boston University Initiative on Cities for collaborating with us and on many other events, and to Meredith Brown and Alicia Noel. And a special thank you at this time to frontline workers who may be watching for all you are doing during this difficult time and always. This is part of a series of events we're hosting on the coronavirus. This pandemic, as everybody knows, is unfolding rapidly, giving little time to reflect. These events are meant to provide context as we look at the pandemic through the lens of contemporary public health issues. Health is shaped by the built environment of communities, the places where we live, work, travel, and play. The physical distancing measures of this moment have reminded us of this. COVID-19 has shown how factors like the layouts of streets, the accessibility of green spaces are core to physical and mental health. This dynamic plays out wherever we live, but perhaps in particular in cities. Cities are where nearly all COVID-19 hotspots have emerged. They are also where the majority of the planet lives. There is then reason to wonder how we can be building cities that are resilient to such future events to mitigate the next pandemic. We are very fortunate today to have with us an expert panel to guide our discussion of how we can design healthier urban spaces in the wake of COVID-19. The format is as follows. Each panelist will speak for about 10 to 12 minutes, and then I shall moderate questions from the audience. Please feel free to use the question tab in your Zoom browser, and I will do my best to get to as many questions as we can. Our first speaker is Jennifer Kismet, CEO of the Kismet Group and former Chief Planner for the City of Toronto. Jennifer. Hello, everyone. Um, it's absolutely wonderful to be participating today, and thank you um, so much to BU and the School of Cities for inviting me to be a part of this, as well as public health. I loved your opening comments, Sandro, in part because sometimes we forget um, when we're talking about public health to make that explicit link between physical spaces and physical design. And as an urban planner, I love nothing more than to collaborate with public health officials because I believe we're in the same business, uh, what we do, um, because city building is all about health and getting the design of our cities right is all about health. So this is a public health crisis, but it's also a crisis of design in our cities. And we're seeing cities respond and act in very different ways. In the comments I'd like to make today, I am going to organize what I'm talking about in three kind of key segments, if you will. The first is the now. When we look at what's happening right now, there are certain characteristics to right now. There are responses by cities to right now and things that we can highlight from uh, this moment that we're in, the right now. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. The second time frame I'll call after now. We don't know exactly when it is, but it's after right now. And it's before the future because it's an in-between phase. It's a moment that isn't the future, and it's not now where we're all sitting at home on webcams. It's, it's something else, and it has a different implication for cities than now has and that the future has. And I, I think of this and talk about this as the in-between time. And then the third time is post-COVID-19. This is the moment when we have a vaccine. This is a moment where we haven't returned to normal. Normal is gone. Um, the before times doesn't exist anymore and we will never go back. And I think most of us are having a tremendous amount of time to contemplate that as we sit at our homes, as some of us eat dinner with our families over and over again, as we worry about vulnerable neighbors and vulnerable loved ones, uh, we know that things don't go back to where they were. And in many ways, uh, we can feel sad about that but we can also embrace it as an opportunity for our cities. So there's these really three phases, if you will. They're epochs, they're eras in and of themselves. And we're in the now, we are very soon going to move into the after now, and then we'll get into the post, uh, post COVID-19, the era when we have a vaccine. When we think about health, when we think about cities, when we think about public space, we need to think in a different way about these three phases. And it can be confusing if we're talking about the design of cities and we're not being clear about which of those three, three timeframes we're talking about because they demand a different kind of response and a different way of thinking about how we live. 
a perfect example, of course, is that right now is primarily characterized by physical distancing. That's a key characteristic of how we're living right now. Right now is also, and this is essential and fundamental to cities, uh, right now is also characterized by unemployment. Unemployment is an enormous part of how our cities are currently being redefined. We only have essential commutes taking place. So we actually went from the before times, which were defined by, for most North Americans, a long commute. We've now very quickly gone into the now, which is defined by no commute at all. Unfortunately, it's accompanied by unemployment and it's accompanied by a tremendous amount of uh, suffering and concern, but we've gone from a long commute to a, to a no commute. Uh, and that has had all kinds of implications in our cities. For example, uh, our streets are underutilized. In the before times, in most of our thriving cities, we had capacity problems. We were talking about the need to expand transit. We were talking about the need to redesign our cities to accommodate growth. That was the before time. In the now, we've got too much roadway. We've also, many of us, our cities have too much transit. We still need a very high level of service, but our service in some areas is fundamentally underutilized, particularly if it doesn't connect into areas where essential workers live or where essential workers need to be going. Those are the main transit connections that are of the highest priority in, in the now. So we need to think about um, right now, how we live demands a whole variety of different responses. So I'd like to just um, walk through what I think some of those responses are for the now that characterize good city planning and good city governance and that characterize a healthful approach to thinking about the right now. And the first one I'll say is this, it's um, adaptations, instant infrastructure, that must characterize the now. So wait a minute, we've got extra roadway, most of us are not commuting at all, but we need physical distancing. Those are all characteristics of the now. We have roadways that are underutilized for cars, but we have sidewalks that are over capacity because we've added a six meter separation between unrelated individuals. This drives us into the need from a public health perspective to very quickly adapt and instantly transform how we use the city infrastructure in our, in, uh, in our neighborhoods and in the city overall. So just to, to, just to be really clear, that's a, that's the instant infrastructure isn't something post COVID-19 that might be relevant, but it's relevant in this moment and it's relevant uh, right now. Uh, we're seeing in cities around the world the now is being responded to with the putting down of Jersey barriers to take over a lane of traffic in order to create more space for people to walk. That's an example of instant infrastructure. Things that often we've assumed we needed an environmental assessment for, or things that often were contentious in our communities. Don't take away parking, don't take away road space. Well, in the now, those things aren't contentious because we've actually got a surplus of road space. We have a surplus of parking. And so we need to be, uh, uh, people who govern need to be thinking very carefully about how to use space in the now based on infant in, in instant infrastructure, based on social distancing as a driver for how we use our public spaces in city and the need to put public health at the, at the forefront of our city planning means that we need to embrace these changes and we need to make them quick. We need to be decisive. In fact, right now is almost too late. Um, I just wanna comment on the now in a risk and I'm hoping some of the other, other panelists will, will pick up on this theme. And the risk is one around uh, an approach that is driven by a lack of trust. If we talk about these three phases, we don't know how we'll feel in the next ones. But this phase, the now has been characterized very much by fear. But cities have always been designed on trust. In fact, democracy is designed on trust. It's designed based on an assumption that the majority of actors will act 
based on the public good. And I would argue that in the now, we need to take trust as a driving approach to the creation of instant infrastructure. If we don't trust people, we shut down parks. If we trust people, we know that access to sunlight and access to physical activity and being out in nature is critical to strengthening our immune systems, which we all are going to need strong immune systems going into the next six months. And we don't act out of fear and uh, cut people out of public spaces and public parks, but we design through instant infrastructure better places so that people can both be out in nature and in parks, but also be maintaining physical distancing, which is absolutely paramount. So that's the now. Um, I'm going to go through the next few phases a little bit more quickly so that I uh, stay within my time limit. Um, but I do want to say that um, I think there'll be some themes and I'm hoping some strands that we can pick up in the discussion from what it is that, uh, that I'm outlining. Because I've, as the first speaker, I've tried to take a broad lens to the, the, the components that I'd like to introduce to the conversation. So the second um, uh, phase, which is after the now, is about incremental change. It is going to be about physical distancing. Let's not fool ourselves. There's, we don't go from here to there without an in-between stage. And physical distancing is going to continue to be essential. So the extent to which we set up adaptations of our streets and our parks, and we create in instant infrastructure in the now, we are positioning ourselves to succeed in the in-between in our cities. That's what we will in fact do. So the two are inherently linked. We need to start thinking about our shared objectives in the after now. Everyone went into lockdown. We um, are quarantined in our homes in the now because we had one key objective, which was preventing death. That was our objective. That's why we're locked in our homes right now. And that's why uh, many of us, most of us are in fact honoring um, physical distancing. Not, not so much for ourselves, but for the vulnerable, vulnerable uh, amongst us, our parents, um, our friends who may have conditions that make them predisposed to in some way catching the virus. In the after now, we're actually gonna have a much more incremental approach. It's going to be quite different. It's not going to be a blanket response. We're now going to be looking at multiple societal objectives that are interlinked and ensuring that we're governing to drive those multitude of objectives forward. So let me give you a specific example that links directly into the adaptations and instant infrastructure I talked about in the now phase. In the after now phase, and we're getting very close to this in, in cities like mine, we have to be thinking very carefully about how we can ensure that our main street retail can survive, that our restaurants in our cities can survive. Now you might think, well, what does that have to do with public health? Well, it has a lot to do with public health. Um, in the places where we've been successful in creating walkable neighborhoods, we have amenities for everyday life within walking distance of home. But as all of us are in quarantine, those neighborhood shops and restaurants and main streets um, are threatened. And the extent to which they disappear, they compromise the vision, which is critical to a healthful city, of having neighborhoods where you can do things within walking distance of home. If, uh, if everyone moving forward shops at Costco, uh, we no longer have neighborhoods with walkable amenities. Um, and I know I've been doing a lot of shopping at Costco um, because our neighborhood Main Street, where I typically shop, has not been set up to accommodate social distancing. So an instant approach based on not fear, but based on trust is to reduce the lanes of traffic in along our main street, many of which are unused right now. No one's driving up and pulling up in their cars. Uh, there's way, way less people that are, are commuting by car. We would adapt those streets and that infrastructure so that we can continue to social distance while also protecting another critical objective which is neighborhood amenities, restaurants and shops within close proximity to home. That's going to be absolutely critical. So the after now is this in-between stage where we're still social distancing, but we're starting to recognize that we can have a more nuanced approach to how we respond 
to the need to mitigate uh, contagion of, um, of this virus. We're going to see in the in-between stage a re-engagement in the public sphere. Um, and that's not a bad thing, but it's going to need to be done in a very careful way. So thinking about things like maybe playground equipment is not going to be opened up, but the park space is going to be opened up in the in-between stage. That's going to be the kind of thinking that will define creating healthy cities in that unknown period where we quite frankly are uh, waiting for herd, herd immunity, where we are unsure as to whether we're going to see the curve uh, bounce back up again, where there's still a lot of uncertainty, but we know we're going to begin to re-engage um, in the city. Um, and it might be that in the after now phase, some of those instant infrastructure adaptations need to be made more permanent and they need to be more significantly advanced. So for example, in France, in Canada, I don't know about in the US, but I suspect it's very similar, uh, more than 60% of trips in cities are within five kilometers of home, an easily bikeable distance. In the city of Toronto, 82% of residents own bikes, but a very small percentage, something like 6%, currently commute to work or commute to do groceries and other things within their neighborhood on bike. Now, the reason for that is really a safety issue. Um, people don't feel safe on streets. We've been sort of having this battle over space on streets in our cities. Well, today, and in the after now phase, the in-between phase, we'll still have extra space in our cities. Many of us will be encouraged, I expect I will be in that category, to continue to work from home for as long as possible, so that as people who do need to use public transit, people who do need to use in the public realm, begin engaging in that public realm, they will in fact have the space that they, that they need. So there's different kinds of responses will be required in that after now phase. Cities like Paris, Milan, Berlin have been very strategic in rolling out strategies that are about putting the emphasis on how people move differently in their cities in the in-between phase, but with an eye to the post-COVID-19 phase. I think of this phase as the phase where we have a vaccine. It's a phase where we're no longer social distancing. We don't know when it is, it will happen. In that phase, we're going to become even broader in how we think about our healthy city objectives. We will be thinking about, based on the lessons that we've learned in quarantine, how we can reinforce the 15 minute neighborhood so that people can do more in the neighborhoods where they live. How we can think about mitigating our impacts on the public transit infrastructure that we, that we have. In my city, the public transit has been completely overwhelmed in the before times. Now it is underwhelmed. Uh, we, in the post-COVID-19, we can suspect that we're going to have to recalibrate how we think about using public transit because more people will be working from home. We've all learned to do this. Uh, it will become more a part of everyday life. We've accelerated a transition to a fundamentally different kind of, um, of work. So there's a whole variety of positive outcomes that we can anticipate in that third phase as a result of these things we've learned in the now around instant adaptations, in the after now when many of us will be choosing to move and live and work in different ways that can bring us forward into what I would consider after post COVID-19. If we choose, we can embrace decarbonized cities. Cities where we're no longer, we'll never go back to the air pollution of the before times. Why would we? We don't need to and we now know that we can live differently. Thank you, Jennifer. That was great. That was a really terrific introduction and overview. Next up is um, uh, uh, Katie Swenson, Senior Principal at the Mass Design Group. Katie. Uh, you're on mute, Katie. Unmute. There you go. Perfect. We got yeah. you now. You're live. Perfect. Um, thank you so much, Sandro. And thank you, Catherine, for the um, invitation to join you today. And thank you, Jennifer. I'm so glad to sort of start dreaming with you all about what the future is going to look like. Um, really appreciate your emphasis on issues of trust and, and kind of understanding where we are at this moment. Um, 
I am a senior principal at Mass Design Group. I've dedicated my career to advancing design for social equity and have had a focus on affordable housing and community development. I'm going to share some slides with you and um, also want to let you know that the resources that I'm going to share with you live today are also all available on the website of massdesign.org. Everything that we're working on in this um, immediate time, as Jennifer mentions, is um, available for, um, it's kind of open source. So we're working rapidly to make this happen. So I'm gonna, um, let's see, I'm gonna share my screen, see if I can do this. And then I'm going to go, uh-oh, to play from start. Um, okay, so let's get going. I, I've chosen to call my talk um, Reimagining Resilient Cities. I, I'm not sure I am personally quite ready for the rebuilding phase yet. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the three phases that Jennifer brought up in a little bit of a different way. Um, first, a minute introduction to Mass Design Group. We're a collective of 125 people around the world. Um, I'm happy to report that each member of our team is well, and despite um, the numerous challenges of working from home, everyone is actively engaged in pursuing our work and our mission. We believe in the power of architecture to either hurt or heal, and I think that this has never been quite as clear as it is today. Over much of our 10 year history, we've partnered with leaders in scientific and medical communities to design spaces, both medical spaces, but spaces of many other kinds, um, essentially asking the question, how can our buildings make us healthier? This has been an undergirding practice of our, um, undergirding belief of our practice. We've also worked in the prevention, containment, and treatment of infectious disease. And I think this history of our work is very important right now and very relevant in mitigating the effects of COVID-19. Um, so I wanted to just um, highlight a few, understanding that we are getting to know COVID-19, all of us right now. We don't know exactly all the ways in which it works. Um, and the vector is um, waterborne uh, transmission. So I wanted to talk about other, a few of the other kinds of transmission vectors, including air, water, and surfaces. Um, we got our start in many ways designing um, to protect against uh, the, uh, protect against tuberculosis. And through the design work, we started to understand that uh, open windows, natural ventilation, encouraging airflow, and introducing air filters and fans were critical, as well as doing other things like eliminating indoor hallways and spaces to congregate. Designing um, for cholera, where the vector was water, became a different strategy. Treating wastewater, providing safe potable water in places that may not have access to it. We've also were immersed in um, Ebola, understand how to design for surfaces and pathogen resistant surfaces. So we get to this moment here and uh, to Jennifer's point, I guess I've been thinking in this three stages as well. And I was calling them relief, reimagine, and then rebuild. We know that the spatial decisions that we make now and the spatial learning, I would say, are gonna have long-term implications in how we respond and prepare for the next epidemic as well. So when we, when we start to talk about this um, relief phase, it's temporary, but it's also critically important that we really learn from this phase as well. So I'm gonna share with you a few things that we're doing and what we're learning. Um, you know, as we uh, were all kind of getting home, we left our offices uh, the March, I think, 12th, and uh, we're all about ready to assemble on our first um, all team, 125 people on Zoom Monday morning at nine o'clock. Um, but right before that meeting started, one of our design directors, Chris Scovel, got a call from one of our Boston partners 
Boston Healthcare from the homeless saying, you know, we're putting up tents. Can you have a look at our plans? Um, we know that temporary spatial solutions such as tent clinics are being rapidly developed. And of course, if poorly designed could actually contribute to the spread of disease uh, rather than mitigate it. So Chris and his team jumped into helping and they made a series of recommendations. So after this process was over, um, we started thinking, okay, if uh, Boston Healthcare for the Homeless is having this need, who else is having this need? And how can we turn our experience with this one partner into a kind of resource that could be readily available to others? Now, I wanna make a very clear um, distinction to say that we are not designing tents or other structures. This is not so much about design. And you can see, um, we've titled this, the rules of thumb for limiting contagion in makeshift facilities. So um, we're trying essentially to uh, learn from our medical and scientific partners, understand the spatial ramifications of COVID-19 and understand how to apply best practices in, um, in very urgent, but not at all best uh, case scenarios. So um, again, all of these are on our website and they've been shared quite widely. So you can see some of the strategies that we implemented, um, separate entrances for providers and patients, thinking about work surfaces and how to clean and disinfect them and creating um, different pathways and um, break areas for staff and patients. Now, um, as we delved more deeply into this work on Monday of this week, we just released um, what I think is an incredible guide that's called Redesigning Hospital Spaces on the Fly to Protect Healthcare Workers. Um, we did this with Mount Sinai Hospital and partners at Ariadne Labs. So Mount Sinai, like many other hospitals, are rapidly adjusting their systems and units for COVID, shifting staff around and converting different units, and creating COVID floors um, in areas of the hospital that were never planned for that. And they've been taking on a series of design hacks, I think, that have been really interesting. You know, they've been putting tape on the floor or paint on the walls for uh, around patient doors to indicate risk zones. They've been installing HEPA filters, moving IVs and monitors outside, designated donning and doffing zones and protective uh, personal equipment for each provider in like brown bags, like lunch bags almost. So we used um, these uh, GoPro cameras um, to work our way through the ward and understand sort of what was going on inside these hospitals. Um, we also, these um, drawings here, we, add, we asked clinicians to do what we called a heat map of each floor that would identify hot clean and warm zones. And you can see in the three diagrams at the bottom of the screen, very different interpretations by um, medical professionals on what was essentially safe. And um, this brings up for, for us what I would call a need for spatial literacy. This kind of greater understanding of what role the building is playing and the strategies that we're applying within buildings to understand uh, both risk, both understand risk, and then of course risk um, mediation. I think we're, we're understanding in many ways the biology, we're focusing on the biology of the risk, but it's interesting to start thinking about the socio sociology of the disease. So meanwhile, we're kind of taking these on um, as we go. And this week you'll be seeing coming up very soon on our website, you're gonna be seeing um, a guide on rethinking car carceral environments during and after COVID-19. 
We're also starting to work with um, a group of uh, restaurant associations, I think as Jennifer said, we know that, um, that the restaurant industry represents 60% of lost jobs. So it's so important for restaurants to get back online. And we're starting to just say, okay, how are we as architects and designers helping people sort of understand um, what they're gonna need to do both to keep people safe, but also to develop trust in the built environment again. And we know that um, offices, um, certainly public transportation, how, what, what level of trust are you gonna need to drop your child at daycare um, before you go to work? And how are we going to be able to rethink those um, environments? So um, we also know that we're gonna have to rethink how, not just the what, but the how. And we're also working on strategies for a kind of remote community engagement at the, at the moment. Um, we also have seven sites that will be opening, um, reopening construction in Rwanda over the next week to month, probably. And so we're gonna be open sourcing and sharing the protocols that we're gonna be putting in place um, just simply to contribute sort of to the dialogue. So this leads me, I guess, to this moment. Um, Jennifer called it the after now. Um, I heard from um, a bunch of colleagues, actually, at the Bar Foundation in Boston about this idea of the, between the relief and the rebuild, that we make sure that we invest in this reimagined space. And um, so thinking about what we have learned along um, this short and urgent road, I think there are a few things. And the first thing is absolutely that we should expect more of our buildings. You know, I think as architects, um, there's no way we would ever um, claim to be on the front line, right? It's, um, we know absolutely that the, um, the medical professionals and others who are truly on the front lines of this COVID virus. But what I would say is that our buildings are on the front line, in fact. And so in some ways, um, we need to step it up as well. I think we've come to understand without a shadow of a doubt that our places and our spaces affect our choices, affect our behavior, affects our health. So how are we going to design all buildings to make us healthier? The next piece is I want to think again about this idea of spatial literacy. I think that we all need to cultivate a closer connection to the spaces, places, and infrastructure around us in the same way that perhaps we're learning that the environment is not an abstract con concept that doesn't affect each of us directly. I think also public spaces, buildings, and transportation systems are not abstract concepts that need to be left to design professionals or planners. We all need to demand more of our built environment. And to do that, we need to be both more aware and to heighten our spatial literacy. The last thing I'm gonna say um, is that I think that we're also realizing that, you know, home has never been more important. Um, you know, in urban planning, sometimes housing is seen as sort of a passive building block in cities. In the world of real estate, sometimes it's seen as like an individual choice or even an investment opportunity. But now here we are with so many of us who are non-essential workers, who are having the experience that home is in fact the only space that we absolutely require. Plus, of course, outdoor space, which Jennifer, um, please open it up for us more. Um, and hospitals, of course, if we become sick, we, yes, grocery stores and pharmacies. But in so many ways, home, our, home is sort of our everything right now. So this time makes me realize more clearly that for mem many members of our society, home is often the place that they spend most of their time certainly true for many seniors. So I want to ask what does this moment tell us um, about how we need to think differently about housing in the future? 
not only do we need homes to do more, that they need to make us healthier and productive, but I also would urge us that we must commit beyond a shadow of a doubt to ensuring that home is available to every person. I heard um, Andrew Cuomo on the radio earlier, on the TV earlier today, talking about the subway in New York City with ridership down 92% and shelters dangerous places of contagion. People without homes are sheltering in the subway systems right now. We've seen homelessness as sort of a personal horror, but I think we have to recognize housing rights as a national imperative and a public health imperative. Um, and the last thing I would say is, yes, I also want to think about this idea of trust and how we get back to understanding that what affects one of us obviously affects all of us. Um, and I hope that we'll not look with our city, at our cities with fear, but rather with a kind of commonality of understanding that will come out of this epidemic and understand that um, we're going to need to take, uh, we're, we, can, we can seize this opportunity to see that these seemingly unsolvable epidemics of the past, whether it's homelessness, whether it's the, it's the environment, whether it's gun violence, that we can take on these epidemics, actually. We can do it if we set our mind to it. So I hope we'll commit to creating a society that holds the dignity of the individual and the collective at the fore. Thank you. Katie, thank you. That was terrific. It really was a public health talk. You were speaking from a design perspective. It was a public health talk. Only your slides are much more beautiful than typical public health slides. <laughs> thank you. The public health, we can never quite achieve that. The other interesting thing is, um, you know, there have been a number of questions, well, even before you start talking about trust, and you actually addressed trust head on in your talk. So thank you. You, you sort of anticipated what a number of questioners were asking. Uh, next up, we have uh, Joan Saba, who's a partner at NBBJ. Joan. Hi, thank you, uh, Dean Galea. I'm so honored to be here. And I also want to thank the School of uh, Public Health. And I'm going to share some slides with you. Okay, so I'm going to come at this in a little different way. Um, I'm going to be looking at it through the lens of being a healthcare architect. I'm a partner at MBBJ and I'm one of our global healthcare leaders. And, and when Dean Galea first asked me about this, you know, I was thinking about, wow, I'm not sure how many answers I have. So he suggested, well, why don't you share what you're learning? And that's what I'm going to do. So I've really focused my career on academic medical centers, particularly those that are in urban environments. And, these are some of the things that have been fascinating to me in that, but really looking at designing for performance and being that human performance, clinical performance, building performance, and actually how these hospitals function and perform within our cities. And the way we get at that performance is thinking about the experience. And so we're actually designing spaces that enable that higher performance in all our facilities, either individually or collectively. And in thinking about health, that's beyond the hospital. We seek health in our city environments for wellness, for mental health, for our social health, and also in the areas uh, where we live. They help to define us, determine who we are, and actually keep us really, really solidly fixed. So when we look at this new experience that many of people are uh, experiencing on the front line, it makes us wonder, you know, how do we design or think about this experience? And what does this mean in terms of moving the future for our hospitals and those especially in the cities that have been the hardest hit? And like uh, my other speaker friends here have said, I think, one of the major takeaways is that designing in public health has never been more important, especially in our cities. And this is an image of a AUB um, medical center in the city of Beirut. And they're threaded throughout our city in the way that they live and, and hold up our cities. And this is illustrated again, this partnership again and again, when we look at some of the disasters that have struck our cities, either natural or man-made, 
And what we've learned like from Katrina and from Sandy, we've learned how to build you know, stronger hospitals to keep out that disaster. And even when there have been disasters that uh, weren't so natural and they've affected us globally, like 9-11, we've strengthened our airports, our utilities, and the way that we go about our business in terms of security against terrorism. But none of these events have affected everybody globally in a personal health kind of sense. And that's what's so different about COVID-19. And COVID-19, it can't be engineered. We can't think about buildings or boundaries that are gonna keep it out. It's a level playing field. So it made me really think about that and on a design level, you know, what can we do for something like this that is a level playing field that we really can't control and it truly is global affecting us. So uh, one way of thinking about this is, okay, we can start thinking about boundaries. And on the left here, this is um, a hospital uh, not too far from our Shanghai office, and it's the fever entrance. And in a lot of hospitals in, in Asia, there is a specific entrance for fevers, and, and that's what you do, you're segregated. Or we can continue thinking about it the way that we're all dealing with it right now in our, our cities, and, and uh, Katie talked about this a bit, and with having the, the temporary tents. And that's, that's a way that we can look at that as well. But, you know, I think we have an opportunity to manage in a pandemic the onslaught of the unexpected and the experience that those who are petrified and very sick and what they're feeling as they approach the hospitals. And maybe, maybe one way to think about this in an urban environment is to think about the outdoor spaces and the access to our hospitals and the way that they create courtyards in other areas where we could have multiple areas for people to congregate and to be able to feel safe about how they're accessing the hospitals and that hospitals in an urban environment have a little bit more control in terms of people coming forward. So that's, that's uh, the second takeaway of thinking about how we can approach this. The third takeaway is the notion of sharing our humanity. And what I think we've learned about this is that we have an opportunity to zero in designing hospitals and the spaces around them that recognize this really basic need for human support for each other. And to think about that as a key design element when we're thinking about our hospitals and not only you know, the way that we experience it, but with social media, is doing for us during this time of COVID-19 that it's constantly in our face and we feel like we're, we're living it. And these are some Instagram shots that I took from a, a couple of hospitals here in Boston. So it's front and center to us and we're very, very close to it. And through the media, we feel it every day. And in fact, it gives us a sense of wanting to show our gratitude. And we've seen that, you know, urbanistically and we've seen that through social media as well. So as a designer, start thinking about, okay, how do we use this idea, this need for human connection, this need to show our gratitude, especially in a really tough environment like a hospital at this time? How can we think about spaces and design that allows us to be human in this way? So that's another takeaway. Um, one more is, and Katie talked about this as well, Jennifer, is I think we have to get used to the fact of designing spaces to live comfortably with the pandemic. And there are a bunch of ways that we can think about that. And the one way that I think is interesting as a designer is to think about this notion of resiliency. And maybe you can think about it as sustainability. Maybe it's, you know, the next and, and getting beyond the now. But when you think about these different levels of resiliency, you can think about, okay, what have we learned from the COVID-19 experience and how might we apply that moving forward? And um, Jennifer talked about this. Certainly there's the resiliency thinking about it environmentally and our cities have never been cleaner. So I think as designers and back with our partnership with public health, and with policymakers and with government, I, I think we have to make a lot of noise about not letting this moment go to waste. 
and to be able to shine a light on this and to be able to go forward and recognize, look what we've achieved from this pandemic. So that, that's one takeaway of a uh, type of resiliency. Um, another type of resiliency is a human resiliency. And I've been thinking about this a lot because, you know, it's just really tragic, the number of people that have died from COVID-19, but many, many more people have survived from it. And as a designer, thinking about how do we design for these people and families that are fighting for their lives and the fear that uh, a couple have already talked about that. And I think that's an interesting notion for a designer, thinking about the human resiliency of the patients and their families. And then, of course, you have to think about the human resiliency of the frontline clinical workers and what they're facing day in and day out. And even as designers today for hospitals, um, we think very much about our clinicians' burnout, but it's been front and center to us now about what they're experiencing every day. And it was even in um, an article in the New York Times this morning, and it was really, really tough reading about the nursing staff at NYU and, and what they're experiencing. So I think, again, as a designer, really taking to heart the kind of emotional, the support, the spiritual support, and actually the safety, and what Katie talked about, knowing where and what safety is. I feel that strongly as designers, that's a point that we have to learn. Another aspect of resiliency that we're learning from COVID-19 is material resiliency. So we were so unprepared for this that a lot of things had to happen quickly, a lot of pop-up hospitals, a lot of materials had to be brought in. A lot of things were built. Some of them weren't even used to their capacity. There are empty hotels, empty dormitories that can't be used because uh, you can't get a stretcher into the elevator or through the corridors. And uh, there's been a lot of waste, a lot of waste. So one of the big takeaways is what can we do differently? And we've been fortunate enough to um, work with uh, a couple of federal agencies to look at, okay, how can we be prepared? And one, one idea is to think about a modular head wall, something that can be used, can be cleaned, can be stacked, can be put away, maybe shared in, within the city, within the urban environment, and then the next time we need them can be brought forth rather than having all the toss away that, that we're experiencing now and, and um, basically all the waste. So that's another takeaway for me in thinking about resiliency. And um, probably uh, the strongest one for me um, is was sort of spurred by looking again at the Times this, this morning. It's the first thing I do in the morning. I don't know if that's good or bad, but uh, and reading through it, and it's this idea of mutual resiliency. And I think this gets right back to the trust that both um, Jennifer and Katie were talking about. And, and there was an article uh, about this event in Brooklyn, and it just made me think about that we're really relying on each other for us to be resilient in terms of a community, in terms of humans. And that's gonna be tough. I mean, it's gonna be tough moving forward unless there's a, a, a real change just in terms of our traditions, our celebrations, our cultures, and our habits. So that's been front and center for me about those challenges that we're gonna to have to face and how this mutual resiliency is really counting on us as individuals and how we act within our urban environments and think about the community as acting as an individual. And I think that's a really great design problem that's gonna take a lot of people to think about that. And and just allow ourselves to dream as designers, how can we enable a place where we feel that we can have mutual resiliency and we're able to act on that? And then I just wanted to close with this image because I think it was from last week. I just love this. And they're practicing their social distancing and they've probably seen a, a lot and wondering what they're thinking about what we've been living through. And I gotta think that, that they're thinking we're learning a lot we're going to get through it, and um, we'll see what tomorrow is all about. So those are my learnings. Thank you. Joan, that was uh, outstanding. Thank you. And uh, you know, this thread, this theme of um, the human element uh, as reflected by cities is, uh, is really fantastic. It really uh, uh, reflects so much what we talk about in public health all the time. Thank you for that. And next is Catherine Lusk, Executive Director at the Boston University Initiative on Cities. Catherine. 
Thank you, Sandra. Let me share my screen with all of you. Let me see. There we go. Okay. Okay. Um, so what I wanted to do with the closing remarks is talk a little bit about what we need next from cities, but with a particular emphasis on what we need next from city leaders. I co-lead the BU Initiative on Cities. We do a lot of research on mayoral leadership and governance, as well as urban environments um, and uh, policies and programs that support the health and well-being of urban populations. Um, the first thing I want to do is a really quick reality check, which is that municipal layoffs and service cuts are coming. You know, the city, the, the post-COVID city is a city in worse fiscal health than it was going into this crisis. Uh, layoffs are coming, furloughs are coming, service cuts are coming. So anything the city does in the near term, certainly the next five years or so, um, is gonna be in mind of that fiscal constraint. The very first thing that um, uh, I wanted to try to touch on that, things that I thought folks wouldn't necessarily talk about. Um, I really think city leaders and cities more generally need to find new ways to help us confront grief together. We haven't gone through a grieving phase yet. People are dying. That's what is happening right now, right? It's what's happening all around us while we're sheltered at home, most of us lucky enough to be healthy and well. Um, and one of the things that I came to realize uh, in 2013, I worked for then Boston Mayor Tom Menino, which meant that I was part of his staff, um, sadly, during the Boston Marathon bombing. And one of the jobs I had at the time was actually to help support the city in determining what to do with the um, memorial that emerged at the site of the marathon attack. And I think what I learned along the way is that this type of behavior, this sort of public mourning and tribute paying and, and sort of tokens of remembrances, these are all instinctive. These are all things that we do in the face of mass tragedy. And we have been deprived of the opportunity to do that while we're all sheltered at home. And it's not only that we we bring things to these spaces. You can see from this, uh, you know, countless thousands of runners actually brought their, their sneakers as tribute in the aftermath of the marathon bombings. But we gather in these spaces. We want to spend time in them. We want to read the messages. We want to draw resiliency and draw strength from these messages. And before we closed the temporary memorial, we actually invited the survivors and their families to come, we closed the whole thing to the public and we invited them to come and to draw strength from the messages that had been shared um, by people in Boston, beyond Boston and around the world. Um, you know, at that time, we also had uh, elected officials who were able to help us make sense of mass tragedy. They were part of the grieving process. This is the interfaith ceremony. So these are all interfaith leaders from around Boston. Um, and this was the interface service that was hosted in Boston with President Obama, with Governor Patrick, with Mayor Menino in the aftermath of the tragedy. And it helped us make sense and come to terms with what had happened and draw strength from one another and from these powerful messages from our, our local and national leaders. We don't have that now. Um, uh, you know, one of the other things that we had was actually the One Fund. So the One Fund was sort of tapping into this outpouring of support, in this case, financial support that people wanted to be directing to survivors and their families, um, as well as to the victims' families. And um, this has been mirrored now with the COVID crisis and the resiliency fund that Mayor Walsh has created that's going to organizations supporting families in need. Um, and I'm also going to add, um, uh, are you seeing my video covering this? I'm also going to add, um, you know, Mayor Walsh had created One Boston Day, and One Boston Day um, is a day of service. So it's one of the other ways that we grieve as a community, but that we also draw strength and resiliency and we contribute through service. So every year on April 15th, Bostonians use that day and devote time to service and serving others in honor of first responders and others who rush to the aid. Um, I also want to say that you know, my hope for resilient cities being more compassionate cities, I want to highlight the fact that um, COVID is a hugely impactful crisis right now, but it is not the only reason that people are dying. It is not the only tragedy that's happening. This, these are tributes and tokens of remembrances that were left in Boston. A young 17-year-old one woman, young woman was killed just a couple of weeks ago due to gun violence, our neighborhoods. Um, I think mayors and other local leaders have an opportunity uh, to respond to the COVID crisis potentially with a new set of tools and find new ways to help us confront grief and trauma, not just around COVID, but around a whole array of issues. Um, bike accidents, bike crashes are another one. This is a ghost bike. These are left at the sites in cities. These are left at the sites of um, tragically of, of traffic crashes. Again, I'm hoping that the resilient city of the future is a much more compassionate city. 
I think a resilient city of the future is one that does a better job of making space for people. All of us have touched on this notion. This is from Yonge Street in Toronto. Actually, Jennifer, uh, a public performance artist, created a social distancing machine to prove the absurdity of trying to actually stay six feet away from anyone else. In Milan, Italy, we saw new plans emerge. And then rapidly, actually, they're creating a new status quo now so that when we come out of our homes, that status quo is already in place and we come to accept that this is the new reality, that there's more space for bikers and walkers in the urban realm. But I want to touch on four points. One, absolutely, we need to be creating more space for people, widening sidewalks, new bus lanes, increased transit frequency, transit frequency. So when we get on a bus, when we get on a train, there's more space. Um, devoting more spaces, we're seeing this in Italy, devoting more spaces to open air markets. Um, select street closures, but especially in neighborhoods at greatest risk, where people feel the most anxiety and that there's the most overcrowding. One thing I haven't seen yet, and I would love to see, is not just engaging with health officials about where risks are greatest in the public realm, in the private realm, but also survey residents. Where are anxiety the highest? Which residents feel vulnerable and where? Is it commuting? Is it shopping? I presumably have a different set of anxieties than someone in Mattapan or someone in the North End or someone living on the North Shore. And this, again, isn't just about COVID. If we understand where residents' anxieties are in their day-to-day -day lives, not just about COVID, but also about other risks um, that may be posed in the public realm, then we can redesign our streets in, in ways that um, make welcoming spaces for all. I'm hoping employers, you can't dictate new workplace policies, but you can recognize employers for formalizing work from home policies, um, staggering work hours, investing in bike parking, investing in EV charging, right? These are things we should be doing anyway. One of the key elements of a resilient city is redundancy. We need more than one way to get to work. We need more than one way to get to the store. And I'm also hoping that these policies are gonna begin to be modeled more frequently and more commonly across this country at City Hall. And lastly, we need public health works and fit city officials to be focusing on making home a healthy space. It's gonna be a really hot summer. There's cold snaps coming again. How are we actually investing in safety so that the folks who have to stay home, who are spending more time working from home, can do it in an environment that is, um, that is actually health promoting. Clear the air, right? We've all seen the photos of clear skies. Uh, Joan had shared some of those. Why go back? Cities have an opportunity to continue invest, to invest in green infrastructure, put trees where they aren't and protect what you have. That's what we're seeing with leading policies from places like Cambridge, Massachusetts. Continue decarbonizing. We talk to anyone in the environmental space and they're saying, please don't regress. Don't give up your plans to decarbonize buildings and transit. With those scarce municipal dollars you're gonna have, let's double down on investing in municipal fleets that are actually using uh, renewable energy sources. We just saw St. Louis this week actually move forward with passing a new building energies ordinance. So we do see cities understand we can't retreat from decarbonization. Making active transit and e-mobility options more widely accessible, right? This isn't just about an electric vehicle. Not everybody is going to lean into an electric vehicle. We also need e-bikes, we need scooters, but more importantly, we need cities to start engaging and educating diverse audiences around how to get access. What do the rebates look like? Where are the routes? What are the rules? What are the resources available to them? And as Jennifer mentioned, um, you know, I just want to, I want to reemphasize this notion. She isn't sort of benefiting from being able to walk to a store, but I am here in Roslindale. You know, my Main Streets district, actually much of it is still open. People are practicing safe, safe social distancing. We are able to walk to the store and get our daily needs met. We need more of these 15 minute neighborhoods and we need zoning um, for, for the, we need zoning and mixed use development that allows for us to continue to sort of live local and embrace these local environments and local neighborhoods. Um, I think we have, COVID has put sort of a finer point on this, that communities of color in particular are historically and still today adver more adversely impacted by poor air quality and it has having significant repercussions for morbidity and mortality related to COVID. Um, I hope now the political will, if it wasn't there before, the political will is there to continue to invest in clean air. And the very last thing is that I have been incredibly inspired to see all of the new communication tools that mayors and other city leaders are using, particularly to reach communities that may have low levels of trust in government, that don't have um, English as a primary language, that may not use even primary social media tools, right? We're not all on Twitter. And so I really hope that the city of the future and a resilient city is one where our elected officials are much more focused as they are today on communicating 
frequently, regularly, with integrity to all residents and meeting them where they are and inspiring confidence that government is actually doing the right thing and working on their behalf and working to promote health and well-being of all residents. That's it. Thank you. Catherine, that, that's uh, incredible. I, um, I'm sorry we're not going to have time for questions, but I actually thought we had four outstanding presentations that really make the case for why cities matter for the health of populations. It's something which, uh, as uh, Catherine knows, I've cared about for, uh, for many years and I've written books on this notion of urban health. But I thought, starting from Jennifer's uh, presentation, talking about the, the moment, sort of the now, the before, the now, the future, moving on to Katie with uh, showing us how that is uh, operationalized and that reflects how cities affect people. And moving on to Joan, talking about the specific buildings and uh, our homes. And then Catherine, by you talking about what city leaders need to do, really to my mind paints a picture of why cities are such an important element that drives health. Because ultimately we create cities, ultimately we build cities. So they represent an enormous opportunity to shape the health of populations. And I think you all show that in a way that is indelible. I, I thought all your presentations were uh, terrific. I was jealous of everybody's slides. Um, so I wanna thank you for uh, showing us those pictures and thank you for joining us today. And I wanna say thank you to all the audience and uh, for all the questions I'm sure you'll be able to uh, um, talk on the side with, uh, with the speakers and uh, everybody stay safe and stay well. And thank you for this conversation. Thank you. Thank you.